Thanks for standing by. Welcome back to the NWR Virtual Healthcare Conference. Next up, we have Paradigm Biopharma and the Managing Director, Paul Rennie. A Paradigm is a late stage drug development company driven by a purpose to improve patients' health and quality of life by discovering, developing and delivering pharmaceutical therapies. Paradigm's current focus is developing injectable pentasan polysulfate sodium, or IPPS, for the treatment of diseases where inflammation plays a major pathogenic role, and it's currently in a phase three for osteoarthritis, which Paul will elaborate on shortly. Just a reminder to ask any questions using the Q&A panel uh, or option within Zoom, and we'll get to those at the end. But without further ado, I'll hand it over to Paul. Thank you very much, Matt, and um, welcome everybody who's online. Um, Matt, I might go to the next slide, please, which will be our standard disclaimer. Thank you. And then on to the next slide, please. Um, so what I, I wanted to do, I understand that there's um, a number of people uh, viewing the presentation that um, are not that familiar with Paradigm. So I just wanted to do a little bit of a recap on who we are, what we do and where we're going, and um, then get into some of the the details of the clinical data that we've generated because we have a lot of confidence in going forward with our phase three program. And I hope to be able to show um, the, the viewers that this is a, a very well-tested molecule and we have some very impressive data to date. Uh, as Matt said, uh, our company is focusing on the very large addressable market of osteoarthritis. Now, osteoarthritis is a condition that affects the entire joint structure. So we see a breakdown of all of the uh, joint structures over time, and that's irreversible, and it tends to lead to the ultimate destruction of the joint requiring a replacement. There are no drugs that are re registered at the moment that um, are disease-modifying drugs, that is, drugs that can actually stop or slow the progression of the disease. All the drugs on the market at the moment are what we call uh, drugs to address the symptoms. So they provide symptomatic relief, uh, reduce pain and in, uh, reduce inflammation, in reducing uh, uh, joint swelling. Um, but in terms of doing things uh, for the joint and trying to slow the disease, there are no products on the market. And that's obviously the holy grail. And it's a, a massive opportunity for the company that gets to that um, disease modifying situation. Just looking at some of the numbers, um, people affected by osteoarthritis in 2020, this is for um, the markets of the United States, EU5, um, Canada, Australia, and also China. Those numbers um, are about 150 million cases of people with active disease. Uh, by 2030, that number is going to increase substantially to 250 million in those markets that I mentioned. And a big part of that is due to um, the increase in body mass index or the uh, obesity epidemic, but also as we have aging population and better diagnosis of the disease, all of these factors contribute to a much larger number of people who will be requiring a pharmaceutical intervention during their disease process. Um, on the right-hand side, a, a very important statistic for all investors is to understand that 81% of people who are on um, medications for osteoarthritis are dissatisfied. So I'll just repeat that. Uh, osteoarthritis patients on medications are dissatisfied with their current treatments. We understand um, why that is the case because many of the drugs that are quite effective in the early stages of osteoarthritis are no longer effective once the disease starts to um, take over the entire um, structures of the joint. Next slide, please. Okay, so a little bit about who we are, what we do. Um, as I mentioned, um, we are working with the drug Pentasan polysulfate sodium or IPPS, and we've also registered the trademark globally, Xylosol. Um, PPS is a well-known, well-characterized drug. It's a non-opioid, non-steroid based drug, and it has been used in humans for over 60 years for treating pain, inflammation, and blood clots in humans. That's our drug and then our clinical program. Um, so we, as I mentioned at the outset, have a lot of confidence going into our phase three program. The reason for that is that we've conducted a number of studies along the journey, looking at this drug in people with osteoarthritis. Our first study uh, was PARA005, which is 121 patients with 
um, mild to severe osteoarthritis, uh, para 008, moderate to severe osteoarthritis in 61 patients. Uh, we have also um, worked with physicians around Australia who want to get access to the drug for people who have basically no longer got any efficacy or feel any efficacy from the um, medications that are on the market. The doctor gets a special uh, dispensation from the federal government to use an experimental drug. Um, and uh, we treated over 600 subjects and collected a lot of clinical data from those subjects. In Australia, the FDA offers a similar program called the Expanded Access Program. Um, that was limited to 10 uh, people. We, we chose 10 ex-NFL players because of our association with the NFL Alumni Health Organisation, which is an organisation that looks after the long-term welfare of ex-NFL players. Uh, we have received from the FDA fast track designation. Um, we did do um, our phase three was in two stages. So we had stage one, which was this adaptive uh, design where we would look at a number of different doses and look at those data and compare it to the, the data that I've just mentioned above, which uses a different uh, dose of the drug, uh, which is two milligram per kilogram twice a week. I'll come on to that later. Um, so we did finish stage one and we randomised over 600 subjects across 120 sites in seven countries. So the, the takeaway point here for investors is that Paradigm has been able to uh, manage its clinical programs and recruit uh, according to our schedule. So we expected to have around 550 patients uh, recruited by June 2023. And we came in with 600 patients in July 2023. So we are uh, well versed in being able to um, execute on the clinical trial recruitment. We do have uh, an opportunity for expedited approval in Australia through the TGA provisional approval process. And uh, we intend to file some documents with the FDA uh, in a couple of weeks. And I'll explain that a bit later. And we've also um, had some very exciting uh, results, uh, so exciting that Paradigm has been invited uh, to give a podium presentation of these data at the upcoming ORSI conference, which is an international uh, research organization designed to disseminate and discuss uh, new data in, in the treatment and understanding of the disease process of osteoarthritis. So all major pharma companies and their scientists will be present at this meeting. And we've been asked to present um, on a podium to uh, talk through the data and therefore generate a lot of interest and a lot of uh, discussion around this molecule and how it treats osteoarthritis. So that's very exciting upcoming uh, event for Paradigm and that occurs in April. Uh, we also know from talking to some of the commercial companies that they will have their scientists and their business development people at these meetings trying to get an idea of what's showing uh, some very significant results uh, in, in clinical studies as the, as the compound progresses through the phase two, phase three process. Um, we also um, have commercial scale manufacturing via our partnership with Bene Pharmachem in Germany. Bene Pharmachem uh, developed um, PPS many years ago, back in the 1950s. And today they are a, a very uh, skilled and experienced manufacturer of PPS. And today it is still the only FDA approved version of the drug for use in humans. So Bene have um, developed up the manufacturing facility to produce a consistent product, which has not been able to be replicated by any other company. So you may look on the internet and see PPS um, uh, suppliers in India or China, I can assure you that those products have tried to get registered in, in the United States, for example, and other countries where the regulators uh, have said, well, this is not the same molecule as the Bene PPS, and it hasn't proceeded into uh, registration within the human uh, pharma industry. Uh, it has gone into some of the veterinary um, uh, markets, but that's that's another story. Uh, we also have exclusivity and market protection via two, two mechanisms. The first is a 25-year uh, post-marketing exclusivity 
around the supply of the only FDA approved version of PPS from Bene Pharmachem. So our competitors cannot approach Bene Pharmachem and get the material and take it to market. That is exclusively in the hands and control of Paradigm. We also um, know that it's a very complex structure and the likelihood of developing an identical product to the Bene product is going to take a lot of time and a lot of money. Um, and it is a significant barrier to entry to generate a, a true generic of this product that would be acceptable to the FDA and other regulators. Also, we have a, quite a, a significant uh, patent portfolio where we have patented the use of this drug for a number of indications, including osteoarthritis um, and a number of other inflammatory diseases. Next slide, please. So now I'm going to talk about some of the clinical data that I mentioned from those trials that we've conducted, uh, just to give you a flavour for the sort of outcomes that we're seeing with our drug in people with um, moderate to severe osteoarthritis. Next slide, please. First slide, this is um, in, in the heading here, para 005. This was our first phase two study, two milligrams per kilogram, subcutaneously, twice a week versus placebo. Um, now, this follow-up was for six months. So as you can see, the red line on the left-hand panel, um, improvement means uh, a downward trend in the, in the line of the graph. You can see the red line is below the blue line. The blue line is placebo. The red line is PPS. Jumping across to the right-hand panel, this is function. So this is um, the uh, joint stiffness. And as you can see, an improvement is an increasing size in the curve. So you see the red line above the blue line indicating a functional improvement, clinically meaningful outcome out to six months. Um, so this was the first um, study that Paradigm did in the use of this drug in, in subjects with moderate to severe osteoarthritis. Next slide, please. Okay, so this now is Para008. This is a second study, and I'll explain the rationale for this study a bit later. Um, but here we're looking at um, really comparing the red and the blue lines again. Uh, on the left-hand panel, this is a pain reduction. This is Womack. Um, a lower uh, trending graph is better than a, a graph that's not as low. So we're looking down to day 56, our primary endpoint, seeing clear separation between the red line, the blue line, the yellow line. The red line is um, PPS, two milligram per kilogram twice a week. The blue line is placebo. The yellow line is PPS once a week. Um, as you can see in this case, we go beyond day 168 out to day 365. And we're seeing still on the, on the uh, trend of that curve from 268 to 365, a downward uh, gradient, whereas the placebo is uh, returning to baseline. So that means that uh, one course of the drug, so that's two injections a week for six weeks, shows clinically meaningful results out to day 365. And I'll explain the relevance of that a bit later. In terms of the, um, the function, again, a similar sort of uh, trend, red line being PPS, two milligrams per kilogram twice a week. And then also the blue line being placebo. And again, very similar um, shape to the, the gradients of those line graphs, um, blue line returning to baseline and the red line PPS continuing to remain stable or even slightly declining, uh, indicating uh, improvement in the function result at day 365. Next slide, please. So this is looking at bar graphs. This is the actual um, WOMAC pain from baseline on the slide that we just looked at. Uh, but this, in this case, we've got histograms. Um, the red histogram uh, is the... Uh, placebo result, and as you can see, it's um, down to you know, minus 28, 29, and then you see correspondingly down to minus 50 at day 56 being the PPS group, and statistically significant at that time point, day 168 at six months, um, and then um, at day 365, uh, again, quite good separation between the two. Interesting to note that post um, day uh, 56, uh, the uh, placebo group overall took five times the rescue medication as did the PPS group. So a significant more amount of rescue medication was used by placebo 
in, in the, um, the months out from the initial six weeks of treatment. Next slide, please. So this is um, same from that uh, line graph. This is now the function data in a bar graph. Um, again, you can see a similar story um, at uh, day 56 being the left-hand side, uh, statistically significant um, reduction or, or reduction in inflammation and improvement in function, um, day 168 data, and then day 365. So very uh, significant results at day 56 and day 365. Next slide, please. So I mentioned before, um, what, what does all of that mean in terms of uh, showing a clinically meaningful results out to day 365? And hopefully this uh, graph that was produced by um, Paradigm's uh, Dr. Rachel Peak will help explain why that's important. So as you can see on the, the first three classes of drugs, uh, paracetamol, NSAIDs, opioids, these are oral medications and their um, window of efficacy is around six to eight hours. So that means that there is medication being taken on a daily basis. And we know that with these, these class of drugs, particularly um, NSAIDs and opioids, they are not um, really indicated for long-term use. Um, particularly opioids, it's um, best to uh, wean off those drugs uh, within the Few, first few days of, of taking them to avoid any dependency issues. So um, obviously being a non-opioid based drug is, is very important, particularly in those countries facing an opioid epidemic. Um, also, we know NSAIDs have links to um, gastrointestinal problems as well as also heart problems. So again, these drugs um, are generally used reluctantly, but they do work in the early stages of osteoarthritis, and hence they're being used that way. Um, jumping down now to some of the um, uh, the drugs that are injected, the first two drugs, corticosteroid, hyaluronic acid, both of these drugs are in, in this case are injected into the joint. So this is uh, corticosteroids, um, one injection into the joint. And as you can see, um, probably for a month or two, you're getting a reasonable um reduction in your symptoms and it tails out to about three months. In the case of hyaluronic acid, um, depending upon the um, hyaluronic acid used, it can be one injection, it can be up to six injections, again, all into the knee, and that extends out to um, four months. So um, both of these drugs are used more in second line once these uh, earlier stage drugs, paracetamol, NSAIDs, opioids, uh, have you know, basically um, continue to be effective, then uh, second line therapy tends to be corticosteroids or hyaluronic acid. Now we look at um, IPPS or xylosol from our data. We've, this graph is able to show that this is not an intra-articular injection. So it's not into the joint, it's just into the, um, the skin uh, around the abdomen. So very similar to an insulin injection or a lot of people becoming familiar with Ozempic, um, a uh, fine needle, um, the drug administered just under the skin into the subcutaneous fat. Uh, we have 12 injections, and as you can see, after the first few injections, the efficacy starts to increase, and that's pretty much maintained out through to 12 months. So in terms of uh, patient convenience, we're, we're talking about a drug administered once every 12 months, as opposed to uh, some other drugs that might be administered three to four times a year into the joint or having to be taken daily um, with some fairly restrictive um, caveats to their use. So that, I think, hopefully summarises uh, the, the market that we're going after. People with osteoarthritis who have uh, failed a lot of other medications, not getting adequate relief and therefore dissatisfied with their medications, uh, opening up a new opportunity and as you'll see from further data, um, we believe that there'll be high uptake because of the data that we've been able to generate uh, thus far. Next slide, please. Now we're moving on to discussion of the phase three osteoarthritis study. Um, as I've mentioned before, we, we've had 120 sites across the US, uh, EU5, uh, UK, Canada, and Australia. Stage one of that 
phase three study, the adaptive design is finished and we are currently um, processing all of that data. Uh, we are going to be approaching the FDA with the um, our assessment to say that uh, based on all of our data and the uh, interim analysis from the first stage, that the, the dose that gives us the best um, safety and efficacy is the two milligram per kilogram twice a week. And we'll be making uh, our recommendation to proceed with that, that dose by updating our IND. So we're currently working on that protocol and we should have that uh, submitted within the coming weeks uh, to the US FDA. That's our, our goal. We have had some delays from some external providers, um, but I can assure all of the investors uh, who, who know the company that uh, all staff are working around the clock to make sure that we meet this deadline and to make sure that we get a very comprehensive and get it right uh, for the FDA to make the data very, very clear and compelling, which we believe it is, uh, but make it to the regulators that they can see the data and all the data is there. It's comprehensive and it's um, uh, very complete. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, the phase three design had stage one and stage two. Stage one was um, an adaptive design rolling into stage two. Stage one was looking at um, a number of different doses and comparing those doses to our data on the two milligram per kilogram twice a week. The FDA asked us to establish the lowest effective dose and they were um, in agreement with this adaptive design. So we were able to um, look at these doses, do an interim analysis, uh, understand all the data, compare it to the two milligram per kilogram twice a week, go back to the FDA, present them with their results, and then hopefully move on uh, with the uh, agreed dosing of two milligram per kilogram twice a week. Next slide, please. So I just want to spend a little bit of time on uh, PARA008. This was our phase two study. Um, next slide, please. So we did PARA005 that I mentioned. Um, that was looking at um, the pain and function, but we also included in that study some um, exploratory endpoints. We were trying to look into the notion of whether the drug is actually providing any healing or regeneration or slowing of the disease. So we um, took MRIs from all of the subjects before and after the administration of the drug or placebo. And uh, just on, on the slide here is one, one case. This is the same patient um, who presented with a grade three BML or bone marrow lesion on MRI. And these lesions are important because they're probably indicators that the cartilage is failing in its ability to provide the, the necessary um, shock absorption properties that, it's, uh, that it has and it's starting to fail. And once it starts to fail, there's significant remodeling that occurs in the, in the bone. So the bone is starting to lay down more bone and it's starting to remodel. And uh, as part of that remodeling, we have a number of cells which are full of water moving into the area and they show up as these um, uh, regions that's outlined in red uh, and classified by radiographers as a bone marrow lesion. That is um, a sign that um, the osteoarthritic disease is starting to uh, ramp up and really start to see some destruction and remodeling occurring. However, on the right hand side of that MRI, you see um, post PPS, this particular patient went from a grade three to a grade two bone marrow lesion at uh, day 53. So a very, very important signal that maybe this drug is not only helping with pain, and improving function, but it's also potentially doing something to uh, address the ongoing destruction of the joint. And that's evidenced by moving from a grade three to a grade two. So most uh, orthopedic surgeons will tell you that um, most bone marrow lesions when present on MRI generally don't resolve and go away. They, they, they generally get larger with time and are associated with more pain and more bone remodeling. And therefore you start to see the formation of osteophytes or bone spurs. And you can imagine two ends of your bone uh, rotating or articulating over um, 
bony spurs is a very painful process. So th these lesions are key indicators for orthopedic surgeons as to potentially the time to um, uh, a joint replacement. So this patient treated with the drug uh, day 56, so only a short period of time, um, was followed up and it saw a very significant reduction in the grade of that lesion or the area, the volume and, and the intensity of that lesion was was uh, all reduced, bringing it down to a grade two. Also, what we did was um, we took serum samples and we measured um, the breakdown fragments of cartilage by uh, pump and CTX2. And we took a look at the serum of people treated with PPS being the yellow bars. And as you can see from baseline to their follow-up at um, uh, day 56, we actually showed that uh, these disease biomarkers were decreasing in the PPS group from baseline. So someone started uh, with a comp measurement at a certain point, and then uh, 56 days later, measured their serum again, and it had gone down. The same with CTX2. CTX2 is a, a fragment from type 2 cartilage, which is the main component of your uh, articular cartilage of the joint. So less of these breakdown products, contrasting that to placebo, going up as we expect um, both those gray, gray, gray bars increasing from baseline. And then we also um, investigated this enzyme that is known to produce the breakdown of agrican and collagen, uh, Adams TS5. And we actually saw that um, in the PPS group going down, the yellow bar going down, and in the placebo group going up. And all of these data were statistically significant of um, changes from baseline versus placebo. So it really um, piqued our interest in terms of being able to say, well, you know, you've got a drug that um, sustains the effect for 12 months. That's a, a, a significant need of the market. And additionally, you've got a drug that's actually doing something to um, maybe reverse the disease, uh, which is also very, very exciting for the market. Next slide, please. So this is a summary of the, um, the, the results from PARA008. Um, and just touching on them, we had objective data. So this is data that is not um, attributable to a person's uh, assessment of their condition. This is actually measuring um, via advanced uh, imaging techniques a result. And so we, we saw that um, uh, in the case of synovial fluid biomarkers, this is biomarkers of disease in the fluid inside the joint. And, and we took samples at day 56 and day 168. And we actually found that the disease biomarkers were decreasing in the PPS group, whereas the disease biomarkers in placebo was increasing. We also um, saw that there was improvement in, this, in the um, structural aspects of the joint, including um, cartilage thickness, cartilage volume, and also um, reduction in osteophytes, which is the bony spurs. We also had subjective data, which is the um, assessment of the, the patient's score from baseline day 56, six months and, and one year. And we also um, got the patients to complete a, a patient global impression of change, which is PGIC highly relevant for this um, pain study. So both of these showed uh, very good uh, clinical outcomes as well as um, imaging outcomes. So showing an improvement in the cartilage thickness and, and volume. Next slide, please. So um, Matt, I'll, I'll, uh, after this slide, I'll just um, get you to fast forward through to the end, I think, because I'm running out of time. Um, so in, in this particular slide, now this is actually measured in microns, as you can see at the top of the slide, microns of cartilage. This is measured by a sophisticated quantitative MRI. Um, as you can see, we'll look in the middle, the medial femoral, femorotibial compartment, um, the red bar going down by minus 40, meaning that patient started the study uh, with a certain thickness of cartilage and then when examined at six months, their cartilage thickness in that region of the joint had decreased by 40 microns. Contrasting to the PPS group who started their 
um, treatment and an MRI to say that they have a certain amount of cartilage thickness, which was baseline. And at six months, they actually had an increase in the cartilage thickness of the same area of the joint uh, to of an increase of 120 microns. So we're seeing the cartilage thickness increase in the PPS group, cartilage thickness decrease in the placebo group. So one conclusion is that the, the drug is actually leading to an increase in cartilage thickness, which um, we have uh, pr presented these data to some of the key researchers globally, and they're very, very excited because they believe this is the first time they've seen structural improvements tracking with clinical improvements. So um, they have asked us to present these data at ORSI. So basically the orthopedic research community is aware of the capacity of this drug and what it's doing. Next slide, please. So we'll just go through, flip through these. Thanks, Matt. Um, maybe near term uh, news flow uh, for people watching this stop will know that we are filing documents with the US FDA in the next few weeks. Um, we will um, be submitting a complete response to a type D meeting that we had with the FDA, uh, which is answering any questions that they have from the data they've seen. Uh, and we will also be submitting a revised uh, protocol. So two documents going into the FDA. Uh, TGA approve, approval, um, provisional approval, the determination meeting, that application goes in in also uh, a few weeks time. Um, and we hope to get the green light from the uh, TGA to proceed on to a, a full submission around July this year, but that's uh, up for uh, review with the TGA. Uh, okay, I think we might move on that just in the interest of time. I'm, um, I'm nearly out of time, so. No problem. Thanks, thanks, Paul. Um, just one very quick question, and we do need to wrap up. Um, someone's just asked, can we have a sense of roughly when TGA determination application may be applied for, and does this also cover New Zealand? I think you touched on it quickly, but just to recap on that one. Yes, um, it, um, I have to speak to the regulatory department about covering New Zealand, um, but uh, my understanding is it's Australia only, um, but the TGA probably that does have reach into New Zealand. Um, but we will be making that application for the determination. That is the TGA need to look at our data and say, yes, this meets all of the criteria. You are now approved to compile a full dossier, which, which um, we will do and hopefully submit that full dossier in Q3, Q4 this year. And then we have um, a 12 month wait before we get a, a final determination from the, uh, the TGA, which will be uh, Q3, Q4, 2025. Thank you, Paul. Um, once again, we are out of time, but uh, if anyone has any further questions, obviously Paul and Simon's emails are there on screen and in the deck. Um, so please feel free to reach out to them. Paul, thanks for your time and uh, thanks to everyone for joining the session. Yes, th thanks everyone for joining and thank you, Matt, for hosting. And um, uh, as, as you say, if anyone has any uh, ongoing questions, please reach out to those emails. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Matt. Take care.